Now, there's much, much more to the story over a span of several years. But one of the big things that happens is that Pharaoh has a dream and Joseph being a child of God, Joseph being somebody who is directly connected to the one true living God, Yah, he interprets the dream for him. And one of the most, why this dream is so important is that it's literally talking about an upcoming famine of seven years in all of the land, not only in Egypt, like literally, if you want to imagine basically the entire Middle East. So he's like, there's going to be seven good years, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. So why was this so important? Basically, he therefore was giving Pharaoh the insight and also therefore the command because then Pharaoh literally entrusted Joseph once again with everything. This is after the whole thing with his wife. He entrusted him with everything again saying, okay, for the seven good years we have, you know, stock up, make sure we have enough food to survive seven years of famine because there's going to be seven years of great plenty. So let's plan and be discerning and be wise and plan for the seven years of famine. Now understand that actually puts not only Joseph, but all of Egypt once again in favor now and in a higher position than all of the neighboring countries because nobody else knew about the upcoming famine. So when it came, his, his brothers and his dad, who were in the land of Canaan still, they obviously were in this famine and every other neighboring land was coming to Egypt to get themselves some like uh, some resources for food, to get uh, rations, basically. All countries came into Egypt to Joseph, directly to Joseph. Listen to what like level of exaltation this is for to buy corn because the famine was so sore in all the lands. And so Joseph was then literally the governor over all the land and he was the one that was then selling to all the people of the land. So literally now Egypt is becoming even more rich and prosperous because of this, because of Joseph, okay? And Joseph's brothers came and they bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Now, doesn't that sound interesting? Because what did his dream say in the beginning? He said that his brothers would bow down to him. Now, again, there's a lot more to go through in all of the chapters of the story, but they don't realize it's, it's their brother, but he knows it's them. And he doesn't reveal himself to them until later, but he nonetheless does feed them and give them. Again, he is being still merciful. He's showing mercy as God shows mercy. He's not denying them. He's not sending a whole army from Egyptians to go and kill all his brothers. No, he's showing mercy on them. And this whole process was, of course, really hard for Joseph because he was trying to keep professional in front of the, uh, the people that worked for him and the Egyptians. Nobody knows that these were his brothers. Nobody knows that what happened to him. No one knows that they tried to kill him, that they sold him to the Egyptians. No one knows these things. And he's like basically grown up, you know, as an Egyptian now. And so when he saw them, like he was wanting to cry. He was trying to find somewhere that he could go and like release himself and cry because it was really difficult to see them and the whole situation. The fact that they were also suffering in famine, that obviously hurt his heart as well. And the thing is, they were the Hebrews and the Egyptians didn't eat with the Hebrews because it was an abomination to the Egyptians because the Hebrews were the slaves of the Egyptians. And so there was this whole other aspect to it where literally even his entire family, he gets them to come and live in Egypt and that the Egyptians will accept the Hebrews. So many layers upon layers of meaning and purpose to Joseph being sold as a slave into, the, into Egypt. Like there's so many levels to it. It's incredible. Again, showing God's wisdom beyond our years, beyond us ever comprehending what is the end like results. That's why you have to trust in him because he knows how it's all going to turn out. You're not trying to figure out what well, I want to do it my way or this way. No. And then when he finally goes to tell them and he cried and he caused every man to go out and he stood when everybody else was gone, like all his, those that worked with him and served him, he made himself known to his brothers. And look at like how righteous his response is. Don't be grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me here. For God did send me before you to preserve life. As in he's seeing the greater purpose of all of it. He's like, I forgive you. Like, really, there's so, this is, story is much bigger than just us, you know. 
For these two years has the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So it was not you that sent me here, meaning to Egypt, but God. I mean, wow. And so his whole family moves to Egypt. He's reconciled with his brothers and his father. And at the very end, uh, when his father dies, uh, so uh, Jacob, or in other words, Israel, then his brothers were still like uneasy. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph or peradventure hates us. Because again, they can't comprehend Joseph's pure godly heart because they are still crooked inside like they're still not born again they're still not saved like they still think that he will act like they would you know and try and get vengeance so they're like oh he probably just waited until our father was dead and now he's certainly going to requite us he's certainly going to revenge us of all the evil which we did unto him like he's definitely going to do it now so then therefore they sent a messenger unto joseph saying your father did command you before he died basically they were really afraid that he was now going to do something to them and so they sent like a pretend message saying actually dad sent a message before he died saying this so shall you say unto joseph forgive i pray you now the trespass of your brethren for theirs and their sin for they did unto you evil and now we pray you forgive the trespass of the servants of the god of your father and joseph wept when they spoke this unto him and his brethren also went and fell down before his face and they said behold we be your servants again what did i read to you at the beginning that was exactly his dream. <laughs> Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Again, look how humble he is, how meek he is. He has that meek spirit like Moses. He, he's clarifying again, vengeance belongs to God. He's not trying to avenge himself at all. In fact, he has no bitterness, no nothing. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass as it is this day, because physically it came to pass, to save much people alive. Again, the purpose for the good and for something much bigger than his own life or even just his family. Now, therefore, fear not, I will nourish you. As in like, yes, you're serving me, but like I'm literally giving you an incredible life. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly unto them. And this is why in Matthew 18, Jesus is reiterating over and over again, if your brother trespasses against you, literally take the example from Joseph in Genesis. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And then it's basically confirming you're not supposed to just be a pushover or allow people to sin against you, but you're not supposed to take vengeance. You're supposed to go and tell them and you are supposed to correct them. Now, if he's going to listen to you, great, you've gained your brother back. But then it goes back to, it gives you literally the process of how to do this properly. And it says, if he doesn't hear you, then take with you uh, one or two more, like two or three witnesses, that in the word of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So it's not behind somebody's back. Then if he will neglect to hear them as well, then tell it unto the church, which means the whole congregation, the, the body of Christ. And if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto you as a heathen man and a publican, meaning that he's no longer your brother. He is a heathen. He is, a, um, he is outside of the church. Now, does that say, therefore, just allow people to be, walk all over you? No. But here's the important thing. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Meaning, what you don't forgive on earth will also be not unforgiven in heaven. And what you shall loose on earth, what you free what you give mercy to, what you forgive on earth shall also be loosed in heaven. This is extremely, that's why he's saying what you do between man and man, woman and woman, human and human on earth is how you will be treated about it in heaven. As in God shows you mercy unto the merciful. He wants you to be merciful like he is merciful. He wants you to be like Joseph in the situation with his brothers and not like his brothers and not like Cain you know, and not trying to seek your own vengeance. For where, uh, and again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. And so likewise shall my heavenly Father do unto you that if you from your hearts, from your hearts, forgive not every one of his brother their trespasses, 
so shall the Lord also not forgive you. This is why in Hosea 6, 6, we're told he desired mercy and not sacrifice. He wants you to actually have a pure and holy heart more so than any physical acts because it naturally